Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 111. That's right, Triple Ones of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for this mailbag episode where we answer some of the best spirits and cocktail related questions our listeners submit via email and social media. Remember, we're here for you. So if at any point you're confused or you need help developing a cocktail formulation, for example, just send a quick email to podcast at modernbarcart.com, like all the folks in today's episode did, and we'll do our best to point you in the right direction. But before we roll up our sleeves and tackle this latest round of questions, let me give you this opportunity, as always, to make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the Harvey Wallbanger. And <laughs> this is a drink that emerged during the cocktail dark ages of the 1970s, an era that I really enjoyed reading about in Derek Brown's new cocktail book, Spirits, Sugar, Water, Bitters. How the Cocktail Conquered the World. To make the Harvey Wallbanger, you'll need one and a half ounces of vodka, four ounces of orange juice, and three quarters of an ounce of Galliano, which is an ingredient I'll elaborate on in just a moment here. In a large rocks glass with ice, add your vodka and then your orange juice. Even though you're just building this drink instead of stirring it, the order is important here because if you add the vodka second, it's not gonna mix as evenly because the more alcohol is in something, the more likely it is to float. So you put that alcohol on top of the orange juice and it's not gonna mix. So vodka first, then orange juice, and then finally float the Galliano on top and garnish with a nice orange slice. A couple really important things to note here. First, if this kind of sounds like a screwdriver to you. It basically is. And the Harvey Wallbanger is just one of many screwdriver variations that came crawling out of the woodwork during the cocktail dark ages. And second, we obviously need to talk about Galliano because it's not a cocktail ingredient that most people are familiar with, especially here in the US. According to Derek Brown in the book I just mentioned, quote, Galliano is one of those products that is indispensable in a bar, if only for three very specific reasons. First, its tall, slender bottle shape helps with the measurement of back bar shelving. Second, its size and thin, tapered neck makes it a handy weapon against would-be assailants. And third, it can make a Harvey Wallbanger." End quote. In terms of its origins and flavor profile, Galliano is an Italian liqueur, but it's certainly not classified as an Amaro. Because it does contain a number of herbs, barks, and spices, I guess some folks out there might consider it a member of the Aperitivo family, but I'm not quite sure I'm one of those people. So definitely an herbal liqueur, maybe an Aperitivo, definitely not an Amaro. The two main flavor notes in Galliano are anise and vanilla, with other woodsy botanicals bobbing around in the background. Much like Strega, another Italian liqueur, it has a bright yellow color, which is gonna be largely drowned out by the orange juice in the Harvey Wallbanger, but as you might imagine, it could lend a compelling color if you wanted to include it in an original cocktail. One last thing to note, as Derek Brown alluded to, the bottle is hefty and tall. So if you're gonna pick one up, just make sure you can fit it into your liquor cabinet or at least be comfortable leaving it out for all to see as you chip away at its contents over the course of what probably will be several years. So now that you know how to make a cocktail with a very silly name, let's turn our attention to some of the excellent questions submitted to us by the Modern Bar Cart community. First up, we've got a question from Lori in North Carolina who writes, Dear Eric, I listen to your podcast every week on my drive to work and I've learned so much about making drinks, but I do have a question I hope you can answer about moonshine. When I was little, I thought that moonshine was illegal liquor that people sipped from mason jars or jugs. 
But now I'm seeing a ton of moonshine at the liquor store. Did moonshine become legal at some point and I just didn't realize? Also, is any of it worth trying? Well, Lori, American moonshine is a fascinating topic, but before I jump into the history and the legality of making it, let me just say that 90% of what you're seeing when you look at the moonshine on your liquor store shelves is marketing. You'll notice that a lot of it comes in mason jars or bottles that are meant to look like vintage jugs, like the, like the things that you were just describing, and this is all designed to evoke the romance and danger of moonshine that became legendary during Prohibition when folks were forced to distill in the woods illegally. Now, to answer your main question, let's rely on our old friend, the squares or rectangle metaphor. Try and stay with me here, because this, this gets a little complicated. All illegally produced spirits are illegal. And here in the US, the generic term for illegally produced spirits is moonshine. However, not all moonshine is illegally produced. If you own a distillery and you operate that distillery in good standing while making an unaged neutral spirit that you call moonshine, then you can put that in a bottle and sell it in a liquor store. A lot of people are under the false impression that making moonshine is illegal simply because you're evading the government who really wants to tax any alcohol that comes off a still. They really like that tax. But if that was the case, we wouldn't call it illegal distilling, we'd call it tax evasion. So there's got to be something more to the moonshine story. Now, you'll recall I mentioned prohibition a few moments ago. During that time, there were two main dangers that accompanied distilling in the woods. One is that you were using a direct fire still made up of mostly improvised components. And if you had any leaks where alcohol vapor could escape, then chances are you and anyone else in the vicinity would be consumed by a fiery explosion. The other danger is the fact that people didn't have the technology or experience to make precise cuts out there in the woods, which means that harmful chemicals like methanol could end up in the hooch, causing all sorts of really bad health side effects. So in summary, Distilling moonshine without a license and without a certified facility is illegal primarily because of the harm you can do to yourself and others, not to mention any property that gets destroyed in a still fire. And yes, okay, also tangentially because the government does want to tax alcohol, but that's way, way, way secondary to the health and safety concerns. Finally, regarding whether or not the moonshine products you're seeing at the liquor store are worth trying. I'm going to caution you that the large majority are probably not worth the price you see them listed for. This is because custom bottles and old-timey labels all jack up the price of the unit, and that gets multiplied across the three-tier system that we have to follow here in the United States, largely because of, ding ding, prohibition. And so by the ounce, the juice inside these kind of gimmicky uh, mason jars and faux jugs maybe doesn't measure up to something that's in a similar bottle. One thing I will say is to consult the label and see if you can learn what the moonshine was made of. Traditionally, corn's used, but it can be made from pretty much anything. So determining the base grain used to make your moonshine is about the only thing I can think of that's going to tell you whether or not you might enjoy drinking it based on other things you may or may not have enjoyed in the past. Next up, we've got a technical question from Jake in Michigan who writes, Hey Eric, I've been listening through a bunch of your old episodes and recently came across your egg-based cocktail interview with Dennis Sendros. My wife and I make a lot of heavier, creamy cocktails during the winter where I live, so I've been practicing with egg white cocktails and I wanted to know if you had an easy way to remember when to do a dry shake and a reverse dry shake. Any help would be greatly appreciated. Jake, thanks for this question. It's a good one for sure. First, let me catch our listeners up to speed on what it means to do both a dry shake and a reverse dry shake, as opposed to shaking as usual, which is typically referred to as a wet shake. Now, a dry shake is when you put all the ingredients of an egg white cocktail into your shaker and shake it without ice. Then you add ice and repeat. The effect here is that the proteins in the egg white denature or kind of uncoil, resulting in a really thick, frothy head on the drink. It's kind of a textural delight. Now, a reverse dry shake might be hard to conceptualize because it sounds like a double negative, right? 
Isn't the reverse of a dry shake just a wet shake? Well, yes and no. The reverse dry shake involves doing a wet shake with ice, so a normal shake, but without the egg white in the drink. Then you remove the ice from the shaker, add the egg white, and dry shake, and then strain into your glass. When it comes to remembering when to use these two methods, I, I don't have a cute little mnemonic device, but I can tell you the flavor implications, which should allow you to walk through your drink recipes and decide when you'd like to add your egg white and whether or not you'd like the rest of the ingredients to be chilled when you do. Those are basically the only two factors you have to consider. Cocktails made with a normal dry shake tend to have the richest, most robust head, and that's because the proteins are allowed to denature before coldness and dilution come into the equation. Those are the two things that kind of inhibit that process. So it makes sense that if you don't have any dilution and you don't have any coldness, then the process of denaturing is going to be the most effective. I recommend dry shaking, especially when you're trying to garnish with something that requires a little backbone to keep it from sinking. So especially if you got something like a dehydrated citrus wheel that's a little on the heavier side, maybe some whole spices that you're trying to work in, the dry shake is going to be the thing that holds those things on the surface of the drink most effectively. Now, if you're looking for a softer gradient between the cocktail and the foam head, maybe think about doing a reverse dry shake. In this situation, you're only giving the egg white half as much time in the shaker, and the overall temperature of the end product is going to be a couple degrees warmer than a dry or wet shake because, think about it, you're removing that ice halfway through and introducing an ingredient in the form of the egg white that's a little warmer than the rest of the ingredients. Usually I only resort to a reverse dry shake when I'm not quite satisfied with the outcome of a given drink made using a regular dry shake. Mostly because it's a major pain to remove the ice from the shaker halfway through, but also because when you want an egg white cocktail, the sky is the limit when it comes to how rich that foam can be. So for sure, I'm on team dry shake, but feel free to try out both methods and let us know which one you prefer. Next up, we have a tropical drink question, courtesy of Scott in Texas, who writes, Hey there, Eric, I just moved into a new home with a lot of space, and I'm in the process of building out my own personal tiki bar. When we have folks over, I'd like to be able to make my own house version of a couple tiki drinks like a zombie or a Mai Tai. I've got my various rums picked out since a lot of drinks require a blend, but I wanted to get your thoughts on how to approach syrups like Orgeat and Falernum. If I make them in my kitchen, how long do you think they'll stay fresh in the fridge? Any thoughts are welcome. Thanks, Scott. I love questions like this one because it's always exciting to embark on a new project in a space where you have room to experiment. So Scott, here are my official thoughts on this situation. The way I think about Falernum versus Orgeat in the simplest of terms is that Orgeat is nutty and perfumed while Falernum is spicy, tangy, and very complex. There are a bunch of different recipes online and we'll link to a few in the show notes. So when you're developing your house recipe, I'd recommend conducting a sort of informal meta-analysis of the first page of Google search results and when you've got all your recipes lined up one next to another, select what you like from each one. Kind of make like a Frankenstein's monster of those recipes using the best attributes of each. Also, whenever I do this, whenever I'm making my house anything, I like to throw in something unexpected to really put my fingerprint on the end product. When it comes to process with these syrups, the difficulty with Orgeat really comes down to the almonds and processing and handling those. You need to blitz those up in a food processor and then let those soak in a pot full of hot, simple syrup for several hours. Then straining can be a bit of a pain, so I'd recommend getting yourself a nut milk or jelly bag, which has a finer gauge than cheesecloth. It still allows the syrup through and you can kind of you know, use your hands to apply pressure and speed up the process, but it's not going to let a lot of the almond particulates through. Once you're all strained there, it's pretty easy. You just need to add rose water or orange blossom water and you're good to go. They're not quite interchangeable, so what I'd recommend is if you're not familiar with them, pick up a bottle of each and, and see which one you prefer for your palate. 
Falernum requires more ingredient prep, usually things like peeling ginger, zesting limes, and crushing whole spices. And some recipes also call for you to make a flavored extract first using high-proof white rum and then add that into a syrup after it's had some time to extract, usually overnight. So when it comes to both falernum and orgeat, there's really no quick solution. They both require steeping, a little bit of planning, and some patience. Now, when it comes to stability, essentially how long these syrups are going to last in the fridge, I'd really recommend going back and giving a listen to our homemade syrups episode, which I'll link to also in the show notes over at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. But here are six things you can do to make sure your homemade syrups last as long as possible. Here we go. Number one, sanitize. This isn't something everybody does before they cook dinner, but when you're working with syrups, it's really important to have a completely sterile workspace and clean hands. Number two, strain thoroughly. This can help reduce the particulate matter that bacteria might enjoy living on. Number three, reduce water activity. Basically, this means making a richer, thicker syrup. The reason why honey can last hundreds of years without going bad is because it's got so much sugar in it. The concept here is similar. The richer you make your syrup, the less water activity there will be. Number four, acidify. Adding citric acid, which is essentially just dried lemon juice, can help ward off certain strains of bacteria. Number five, add alcohol. If you're worried about stability, opt for a recipe, especially with falernum here, that includes booze. And not just an ounce or two. That's only going to, you know, really raise the ABV just a little bit. But think about it this way. It's your house. So if your falernum is on the boozier side, just dial back the booze in the rest of the cocktail formulation to compensate. Your house your rules, you get to do what you want. And finally, number six, spice is nice. Syrups with ingredients that have antimicrobial and or antifungal properties like clove, cinnamon, and ginger definitely have a better shot at a long shelf life than syrups without them. And this is something I know from experience. I can vouch for this effect. So ultimately, from a stability standpoint, I think falernum has the edge over orgeat since it's got, you know, some cinnamon and or cloves in there and usually calls for alcohol. But you know what? With a little practice and some tweaking, I'm confident you'll be able to develop some house recipes that are really going to blow away your guests. Our last question for this episode comes to us from Ariana in New York. And it's not just a question. It's a challenge. Ariana writes, Hi Eric, I love your podcast and I can tell you really like designing cocktails, so I'm hoping I can persuade you to weigh in on a cocktail party I'm trying to throw. In about a month, a number of my husband's extended family members are visiting from Italy and I wanted to design a custom cocktail using a blend of New York and Italian ingredients. If you were in my position, what would you make? I guess I'm really asking you to do the hard work for me. Thanks for any advice you may have. Ariana, lucky for you, I enjoy a good challenge, and also lucky for you, New York and Italian ingredients tend to go really well together. Due to the heavy Italian influence in many parts of New York, you'll find that most good liquor stores are going to have a decent selection of Italian liqueurs, vermouths, and amari. So right off the bat, you're in good shape. Target-rich environment. Now, when it comes to cocktails, you really want to ask yourself whether you'll be making the cocktail like to order, like individual cocktails for individual people, whether you're going to set up kind of a make your own bar format, or whether you're going to do a large format punch or pre-bottled or pre-batched cocktail. So since I'm feeling good today, since I'm feeling generous here, I'll give you a drink option for each of those three use cases. If you have the time and space to shake each drink to order, I'd recommend featuring a riff on a New York sour. The basic formulation here is rye whiskey, lemon juice, simple syrup, egg white, and a red wine float. So for ease of pouring, you can actually still do a little bit of pre-batching in this situation. You can pre-mix the booze, citrus, and simple syrup right before folks arrive, and then add that and the egg white to the shaker, shake it up, and then once it's in your cocktail glass, top up with the red wine float. That's actually not all that hard to execute 
relative to the fact that this cocktail has egg white and a float. So it's, it's a little bit on the trickier side to make, but if you do that pre-batching right before folks arrive, it's going to be fairly simple for you to measure out and execute quickly. And here's the kicker. I'm not sure where your husband's family's from in Italy, but it could be a really neat gesture to feature a wine from that region as your float. Throw in a local New York-based rye whiskey and you're good to go. Now, if you're doing a make-your-own cocktail bar, I'd probably go with something bubbly, like a spin on an Aperol spritz. And maybe, I'm just spitballing here, maybe you could feature a sparkling wine from the Finger Lakes region, since they make some really, really great white wine, and maybe some options like local bitters, and of course, it's always fun to have a bowl of pre-prepped garnishes when you're doing the make-your-own cocktail bar. And finally, if you wanted to batch up something simultaneously exotic and familiar to folks from Italia, why not go with a large format Jungle Bird? It's a tiki drink with lime juice, pineapple juice, and Campari, so you've got your Italian aperitivo, to which you might add a locally produced rum. And the nice thing is, you can batch this up before the party, and you've got two options. You can either add dilution and refrigerate it for a little bit, or you can batch the cocktail, do all of that work, and then literally just pour it in the shaker and shake to order. So it's kind of like a somewhere in between a made-to-order and a pre-batch drink. Ariana, I hope those recommendations are at least somewhat helpful. I hope one of those directions is interesting to you. And definitely hit us up and let us know how the cocktails go over and maybe tag us on Instagram when you show them off. We'd love to uh, see a little cheers from all the folks from Italy. That's it for this mailbag episode of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. Remember, keep those questions coming and we'll keep answering them. Until next time, I'm Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. Thanks for listening. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, excellent spirits and cocktail questions from our listeners around the country, and a little bit of question answering magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2019.